counting 152 attendees right now, and that's a wonderful turnout for um, a lecture and conversation with Paul Paji Sibuya and uh, and with uh, Brian Wilson, hosted by Amy Owen and myself, Greg Niemeyer from UC Berkeley, and Amy Owen from the McAvoy Foundation for the Arts, with technical support by Dylan Thomas. And uh, it's great to see you all. So thanks for spending the evening uh, hour with us. And I'm going to uh, pass on the word to Amy Owen, who's the exhibitions manager at the McAvoy Foundation for the Arts. Excellent. Thank you so much, Greg, um, for that generous introduction. Um, hi, and uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're thrilled to be working in partnership with the Department of Art Practice practice and the Arts Research Center at UC Berkeley for this talk and conversation with Paul Mpaji Sapoya and Julia Bryan Wilson and I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce them tonight. This event is part of our McAvoy Arts at Home initiative to celebrate Bay Area artists and institutions while direct access to culture is limited by the current health crisis. McAvoy Arts partners with a broad range of cultural producers and institutions to encourage dialogue and conversation with all kinds of audiences. We're grateful to UC Berkeley's Arts and Ideas platform for the generous opportunity to be included in this growing series, especially as we expand our commitment to this partnership model on a virtual stage. This conversation, oh, excuse me, let me just, there we go. This conversation comes about in conjunction with McAvoy Arts' current exhibition, Orlando, which celebrates the legacy of Virginia Woolf's 1928 novel and has been guest curated by Tilda Swinton and organized by Aperture. We've been super lucky to have Paul's work on view as part of the exhibition until recent shelter at home orders took effect. But this event allows us the opportunity for an expanded conversation about the project which was commissioned for the exhibition and created while Paul was in residence at the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation in 2019. His larger practice explores ideas of how pictures are made, seen, and circulated through examinations of the studio, queerness, and the intimacy between artist and subject. And we're excited to hear more about his recent monograph, which was just co-published by Aperture and the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, and his latest solo exhibition, A Conversation Around Pictures, which opened at Veal Matter in Los Angeles just prior to the gallery's temporary closure in March. Paul is joined by Julia Bryan Wilson, the Doris and Clarice Mallow Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art at UC Berkeley, and the director of the Berkeley Arts Research Center. We're grateful to both of them for joining us. Thank you so much for your time. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few brief words about both Orlando, the book, and the exhibition, um, as seen here in a few installation shots from the McAvoy Arts Gallery space in the dog patch of San Francisco. To provide a bit of context heading in um, to the talk and conversation, the exhibition presents both recent and newly commissioned photography alongside a selection of works from the McAvoy family collection that directly respond to Wolf's novel. Book and now classic 1992 film adaptation by Sally Potter, starring Swinton, tells the story of a young nobleman during the era of Queen Elizabeth who somehow lives for three centuries without aging and mysteriously shifts gender along the way. Many of the novel's core themes, such as gender fluidity, transformation, and timelessness, are reflected throughout the exhibition by its artists, including Carmen Winant and Lynn Hirschman Leeson, Oops, as seen as in the last uh, slide here um, with Zachary Drucker, Paul's work on the left, um, which we'll see more of in a moment, and Micheline Thomas on the back wall. There's Paul's work again, commissioned especially for the show. And then um, here we have Collier Shore on the left, um, Lorna Simpson, and several other artists from the McAvoy family collection. Um, so with that, um, I will now turn things back over to Greg for a few um, key notes on Zoom logistics and etiquette um, for our session, and then we'll move right into he to hearing from Paul. Um, thanks so much again to all of you for joining us. Okay, thanks so much, Amy, for the thoughtful introduction. Yeah. I'd like to um, say a few things about the webinar experience. Uh, this is not a regular Zoom talk because um, we have to manage uh, 
various kinds of interference. But uh, we can all see your all names on our end and see if you want to uh, speak. You can raise your hand. Also, the chat is currently open. If the chat can't be maintained uh, due to uh, uh, inappropriate uh, in, uncivil discourse, we'll turn it off. But uh, we had had no problems with that so far. So we we assume that the chat will be running the whole time. And at the very end, after um, Julia is uh, concluding her conversation with Paul, um, we'll open uh, the space up for questions. And you can post your questions in the Q&A box. And I will read them aloud, and uh, Paul will be able to answer them like that. Um, with that, uh, looking forward to uh, inspiration, civil discourse, and uh, a lot of beautiful artwork. And uh, let's pass the word on to our speaker for today, Paul Mpaji Sapuya. Thank you so much. And here we go. So we're going to switch slides now. Hey. Hello. Hi, everyone out there. Um, can't see your faces, but I think it seems like a full house. <laughs> so thank you. Um, let me switch to share to share my screen. Um, let's do this. And I hope you all can everything is working out. Um, thanks for thanks for joining. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna do um, a different kind of artist talk, like kind of connecting things in a way that I haven't before. Um, because I wanted to sort of redirect um, things towards a conversation on not only Orlando, but how I came to um, encounter the, the book. Um, and then that alongside other texts that have been really important for me in building up to the work that you see here. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more of the details on those initial, um, on those five individual works. But as was described, this was a new set of pictures that came together after um, Fred Planet Aperture asked if I'd like to contribute to this issue guest curated by um, Tilda Swint. And that is um, making work based on sort of like a, a request around a theme is not the way I work. So it was actually a really, it was like a huge challenge. Um, but I want to kind of give a little context to where I was. So I was at the Robert Rauschenberg residency last winter um, in January, um, January to February of 2019. And it's in, um, so it's in Florida on the Gulf Coast. And this is the play, this is the house that I made all of the work in called the Fish House. And um, anyone who's been um, to that residency, which is such a beautiful place, sort of like knows this, this, um, this location. And when I go to residencies, I tend not to, um, I tend not to uh, generate new work there per se. I tend to edit and think and write. But I did bring my camera and I just began sort of photographing myself in this home. Um, in this little sort of like, uh, it's probably the size of a New York studio, one bedroom apartment, um, but it's a really beautiful little place. And I was sort of photographing myself every day and looking out over the ocean. Um, and so this is sort of another image of work that I made there. And I'm not gonna go too much into these um, because um, you know there's other places where I kind of talk about um, these sort of like mirror self portraits, but that's just, the place um, because it kind of does become important when it came down to making that um, those five images. But I wanna um, sort of like start back to how I came across Orlando. Um, and it was just on TV at some point when I was a teenager. Um, and I don't recall why I sat down and watched it, but it, to be honest, it may have been because I had like a teenage crush on 1990s Billy Zane. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's why I, I uh, tuned into it, but it quickly became, and this is something that, that would tended to happen in terms of like visual culture and images, is I would be drawn to something and then later on, um, I would return to it as a way of answering a question that, um, that other aspects of my work led me to, um, to uh, sort of like conceive of. 
So I just want to say, like, I didn't come to Orlando sort of through like a really like studious thinking about like modernist, modernist literature and sort of like queer identity. No, it was just sort of like a happen chance on Cinemax, on cable. Um, but the thing that really drew me to this text is the relationship between Virginia Woolf and sort of the subject who becomes Orlando, um, Vita Sackville West, who, is, who was sort of the last in the line of this um, noble family that stretches back to Elizabeth I through her ancestry and was disinherited because she was a woman. And she is a complicated sort of like queer sort of like ancestor. Um, and, you know, you could, one could talk, you know, at, for hours on just sort of the subject of, of Vida, who was also a writer. Um, but I wanted to show here um, a proof of Orlando that sort of sketches out what we sort of see here, if you can see my, my mouse, um, Virginia Woolf sort of like writing out the dedication. Uh, and there's, I love this part in, if you read Virginia Woolf's diary, or uh, Virginia Woolf's letters and correspondences, there's a letter to Vida that sort of, where she describes this moment where, where uh, Vita is, has sort of like ended her, her romantic relationship with Virginia Woolf and, and taken up with this woman named Mary Campbell, uh, Virginia sort of jests, oh, what if this book became all about you and sort of like laid bare the desires of your flesh? There's something about the way in which the novel, which is a play on biography, is also sort of like a declaration of uh, an artist working through um, a relationship to a subject, which I find very powerful when it comes to thinking about photography. But I also want to lay out a couple other um, things that are, have been super important to me in terms of books. And one is The Same River Twice by Alice Walker, which is a really beautiful book about the process of, of writing, of um, making a work and letting it go into the world. It combines her own diaries, memoirs, um, and uh, press, all these things that went around the transformation of, um, of the color purple from a book to a film and sort of what that loss um, entailed. Um, and the, it's, there's, it's about this sort of, that always sort of returning to, the, to the, the complications and the production of art making that's really compelling for me. This is an image that I show in most slides, in most artist talks that I do about um, Miss uh, Jean Weisinger, who um, this portrait, which is titled Seeing Myself Through Alice Walker's Eyes, and it's about an exchange that happened when Weisinger set out to make a portrait of Alice Walker and um, Walker's sort of like desire to kind of like flip the script and look out at, at uh, Jean. And so there's also this between this text and Orlando, there's also sort of a, a crossing of disciplines um, where sort of where suddenly a photographer, uh, uh, a writer becomes a photographer or transforming a photographic project. Um, and then there's also that way in which Virginia Woolf and um, Vanessa Bell use photography to depict Orlando. And then the third is A Lover's Discourse by Roland Barth. People often talk about Camera Lucida when it comes to Barth. Um, and I would be fine if I never read Camera Lucida again, to be honest, but we do for some reason. But A Lover's Discourse became a, the first real structuring um, text for me um, because what I want to, um, and I, I just wanted to show one of the, um, one of these sort of fragments called identification. And so in this, he, he um, it's framed around um, the subject um, a sort of amorous subject and um, the sort of the declarations that the act of, uh, that the process of desire is sort of, is located in the, um, in, in, the, in the amorous subject and not the beloved object. And that was actually the title of my first project, Amorous Subject and Beloved Object, and this is why. Because when I first set, set out to make portraits, um, I thought that they, that looking at these people, this um, these people who I was just getting to meet, people who I um, was trying to get to know, um, would offer me some sort of uh, clear um, uh, understanding of who these subjects, these people I was beginning to know were. But what I soon realized is that 
that pointing my camera, that this process of making photographs is really about what I was trying to say and me working through um, of, of, of uh, my own questions. Um, and so there's, there, you know, this was also based on this um, kind of like assumption um, that that's sort of really built into photography that it being sort of like having that potential to be sort of like a precise um, tool for recording would offer sort of like a precise document. It might help stabilize through an image, otherwise unstable subjects. Um, but I realized that's also not the case. The act of making work did nothing but sort of complicate the very things that I was looking at. And somewhere along the line, I had this sort of like moment where I stumbled, where I was suddenly trying to make portrait a portrait that failed. I was making, a, I was trying to make a portrait to resolve an indeterminate relationship, complicated, romantic, platonic relationship through the act of photographing. And I realized at that moment that there, it was impossible. There was an impossibility to produce an image. That photography could not answer the thing that I sort of like sought out. And this is about two years into this, this uh, project, about 2007. And this is in another set of texts that were really important to me, which is Lawrence Durrell's Alexandria Quartet, um, which really, um, what's the quickest way to say it? He is, um, there are four novels that are all centered around a, a subject, um, a writer, suffering writer's block who's trying to recount his relationship with a woman named Justine. And one of them, and, and it's happening after the fact. He's trying to sort of piece things together. And each one of the books is the same um, circumstance told through different point positions. And what it really does, because when you think, when I think about photography, there's a sort of like, um, uh, kind of always coming back to a central point position that is my position behind the camera looking out. And so introducing sort of the mutability of, of the thing that's being looked at was found, I found in um, Lawrence Durrell's Alexandria Quartet. But again, this is not some, I, you know, I had come across um, uh, Durrell's writing about the same time that I did uh, Virginia Woolf through film. There's sort of like a very, melodramatic 1960s adaptation of um, the of the first book Justine and so I caught that on television and I found the book later on in a bookstore and I read it and I put it down and this is something that happens quite often to me is I'll you know it's like oh this is interesting and at that moment when I could no longer make a photograph I realized in the text it provided me a strategy that perhaps the image that I needed to make could be sourced through these fragments that I had kind of carried around, each of them individually being sort of unresolved and I could produce something else. And so there's a project I made in 2008 called Alexandria, which I pulled from my old Blackberry, it was like a Blackberry Pearl phone or whatever you had at that time. I sort of went through these sort of like these, these uh, sort of other failed images that attempted to capture this subject. Um, and I used those as a stand-in. And those were also paired with me pulling pages from each one of these books, um, one, pages that come from each one of the four novels and overlaying them with um, uh, uh, an enlarged photograph that was cut in the 16 pieces laid over 16 pages that in themselves, each one was a fragment of a, of a failed portrait of this subject. And so it, um, yeah, so, you know, I've never shown this project in an artist talk before, but I want to say it's sort of really important because all of these earlier works and to an extent what I'm currently doing, um, at, at behind the scenes, there is this sort of return to, um, to literature. I can talk more about these if someone has questions later. Okay, and then the final um, text that I also wanted that I wanted to talk about as well is Richard Bruce Nugent's um, 
short story called Smoke Lilies and Jade from 1926. And so Orlando comes out and is published in 1928, I believe. And so there's something about this, uh, uh, a parallel between the two. Um, so Bruce Nugent's text is the, uh, is, um, the first sort of first publicly acknowledged, as far as I know, um, queer writing by a Black American author, right? And also, there's something that, for me, spoke so much, so clearly about um, the underlying structures of portraiture, being this sort of first person wandering through the streets of Harlem, through um, his uh, identification with subjects of desire, with the naming of names, um, that, that, that um, the subject in this is, He's, his, he moves through these spaces, but his own sort of like position is only really, um, can only sort of like be determined by this larger web of, of recognition. And this is um, also very much related for me to ideas of portraiture. But also there was, a, this, there was a, an interesting sort of like ambivalence in, um, in his relationship to the Harlem Renaissance. And that was something that I was also really sort of like dealing with because in a lot of my work, there are these, um, these sort of like forefronting complications of race and representation, but it was never really like confronted kind of head on. Um, but what starts to happen later in, um, in my work around 2016, um, when I came back to California and I went back to grad school and I started really like working through um, my archive of, of images. And actually what we see in here is some, is actually some drawings by Richard Bruce Nugent. He also did these sort of erotic illustrations. Um, but anyways, that's a tangent. Um, I started using a mirror in order to to you know, kind of continuing this strategy that developed with the Alexandria project in 2008, the, the idea of pulling fragments to kind of reconstitute images. Um, and I began using the surface of a mirror as a way to do this and to, so that I would incorporate my own sort of position. And here you can see my a reflection of my arm. Um, this work ends up becoming what people are most familiar with. Um, which uh, began with a project called um, Figures, Grounds, and Studies, and then moved on to um, the most recent projects, uh, Dark Room. But one thing that, um, that emerges with, with um, the incorporation of the mirrors is this idea of sort of latent, uh, is, is the fact that I am always incorporated into the work, but also that the mirror itself is able to kind of hold on to a type of latent information, this trace and touch. In this image here, what you see is my fingerprints. My fingerprints, which are only visible because the rest of the image erases them against the, the white wall that's reflected in the mirror. But where the black of the camera tripod intersects, then they're suddenly made visible. And this sort of set up an entire kind of like uh, uh, it opened up a whole other realm of thinking about how um, there is sort of like an embedded sort of like history and dependence on blackness in order to produce a certain type of image. Um, and so I'm going to show some work here from uh, these uh, mirror works um, from 2016, the beginning of Figures, Grounds, and Studies, that again incorporate the use of, I would use either drapery, black velvets, black fabrics, or my body um, mirrors, and then fragments that would be pulled from my own sort of personal um, archive. These are just sort of like uh, printed out on laser printers and I would affix them in my studio. But also I started to really think about the sort of, um, the, the relationship between touch and control and also the relationship between um, actually sort of being more direct about the relationship of collaboration, of muting, and so for example, this work model study is made with a friend who at that point we I um, had been 
imaging him for years, several years before, and I wanted to bring him into this project. But I was really interested in this idea of, of really inserting myself in terms of control, as well as the relationship of black bodies to white bodies in terms of which is the support and which is the subject, which is in control, and which is um, the, the sort of the subject of that control as well as these elements of, of, um, of sort of like obscuring and sort of like revealing through. Um, and, and then there are these works that are, that like introduce um, kind of like a confusion or a doubling of bodies. I was really interested in this thing that would happen, which I wanna show over the next couple of slides, which is sort of like a collapsing of figures that, um, that uh, as this work started getting out, um, fragments of black bodies tended to be collapsed into us, uh, assumptions that everyone was a self-portrait, that I could sort of play with a multiplicity of, um, of uh, other subjects, of friends, and that they would all, that they would sort of be misread, as well as the way in which bodies on the other end, that, um, that, uh, that, brown bodies of, of towards the lighter spectrum would kind of get moved towards whiteness. There was this sort of interesting thing that was happening. Um, for example, body, bodies of Asian or Latinx friends or middle or uh, let's say Western Asian friends would get read as white. And so I was really interested in sort of what could be disclosed and what could be seen and really thinking about in all the, the elements that went into the images, how um, there's a sort of like interdependence um, in the structure of, of uh, uh, sometimes I say it's kind of like a structure that Maplethorpe set up, even though it goes much deeper than that, but that it really pulls. And so um, as this, you know, this is kind of what I'm thinking about as I entered into, um, into uh, how I would make the photographs for Orlando. Um, this here, um, this darkroom mirror study is the first attempt that I made to photograph just the mirror surface itself. Um, again, that surface being the thing that held these sorts of traces um, around them, that became these, these images, and I think some of these are a little bit uh, more well known, where again, I'm using um, my body and the black velvet to kind of reveal all the latency on this, these mirror surfaces. So what, I, so what I'm trying to say here is with, within this, I'm really trying to find a way to insert like this complicated interdependence of like the, the hierarchy of, of light and brightness in photography with, with the fact that like it requires blackness, it requires a retreat into a materiality. Um, and a, and a type of subjectivity in order for any image to become possible. Um, that I sort of wanted to free up um, some of the burdens of representation into um, the medium itself so that they could not be, let's say, overlooked from here on out. So now I want to get to Orlando. So, and this kind of goes to this thing that I always had the hardest time with every time I opened up that book to read it. So I'm gonna read the first paragraph of the text. So Virginia Woolf writes, chapter one, he, for there could be no doubt of his sex, thought though the fashion of the time did something to disguise it, was in the act of slicing at the head of a moor, which swung from the rafters. It was the color of an old football, and more or less the shape of one, save for the sunken cheeks and a strand or two of coarse, dry hair, like the hair on a coconut. Orlando's father, or perhaps his grandfather, had struck it from the shoulders of a vast pagan who had started up under the moon in the barbarian fields of Africa, and now it swung gently, perpetually, in the breeze which never ceased blowing through the attic rooms of the gigantic house of the Lord who had slain him. So, yeah, it's like, what do you make of this? I mean, I have to admit, Orlando is one of my favorite books. And it's interesting because I would read it for all, for, for this the really beautiful way, like, ways in which Wolf weaves together, like, this, um, uh, this, the complications 
of, of uh, language and desire and disclosure. And I would often just sort of like jump over this, but I realized when approached to um, make a work in response to it and, you know, every, you know, the, the initial thing that everyone is thinking about is questions of gender and sexuality, et cetera. Um, and because those are very important conversations that we're having right now, it was, it's so easy to just slide over the fact that it's like, horrific scene that sets up the entire legacy upon which Orlando's name and home and lineage are going to be built upon. So it begins in the, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Um, this is a depiction of a, a depiction of Orlando as a boy. Um, and Vita set and so which it's based on the, the Sackville family, Vita Sackville West, her descendant first Sackville was um, was uh, given this position by Elizabeth I. And as I said, she's sort of the end of the line. So again, this book tra traces that. But his name and his honor depend depended on this colonial violent conquest and capture of this Black subject uh, who's, or who this child is just sort of like beating at and he's not even really thinking about it. So as I was sitting, you know, so I, I sat for maybe a week and a half or two weeks, like not knowing what to do, but all I could do was really, I, I started looking through, um, uh, through uh, libraries, there's some, there's books, a lot of books at the residency as well as online and just sourcing depictions in European collections of Moors and filling this, filling that little, that fish house the residency with them and not really knowing what to do and then i started really looking up into so what you're seeing here in this one is i'm i've i've i'm photographing myself and i've turned i'm looking up into the rafters thinking about up into that space um i began sort of um i guess th this is very sort of straightforward i guess i don't need to really break down exactly what i'm doing in but I guess I'll say in each one of them, you're looking into the reflection of a mirror that swung on this door. And so I'm moving through the space and I'm really sort of like trying to find this subject and kind of think about the position swinging from those rafters, as well as that line of, you know, of uh, one of Orlando's, Orlando's father, you know, across the ocean and thinking about the whole, the history of implication of, of ocean not only just sort of across the Mediterranean between Europe and Africa, um, between Europe and the Moor and the Moorish people, but this, you know, the great Atlantic as well. And so I'm looking out onto the, onto the Gulf of Mexico here. And again, and wanting to sort of incorporate myself into it through the shadow. And then with these, is letting the light sort of from across the ocean spill through the windows and sort of illuminate these two these two subjects. So that's what I was really thinking about. It was um, this is the last image, um, and again, you know, I was really happy to have this this sort of like opportunity to think about make, making work in a in a different way, um, and. Uh, yeah, I really was sad to not be able to see the exhibition at the McAvoy Center uh, Foundation in person, but I was able to see it at its first iteration um, at Aperture in New York. Um, so I'm going to end on this installation view. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess we'll hand it over to Julia. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. That was amazing. It was wonderful to hear your, um, a different kind of genealogy. Um, as you said, it's somewhat different artist talk for you that really centered on your relationship um, with literature in some ways, you know, um, going back in your own history. I guess my first question, well, my first question is kind of a comment, but it will segue into mm -hmm. other questions, is just to express gratitude to you for pointing um, the show, um, the show about Orlando, to that first paragraph, um, which I do think is is a kind of a, has been a stumbling mm -hmm. block, you know, for many readers. And it puts me in mind, of course, of Edward Said's fundamental insight that so much literature by white British writers is dependent upon 
violent legacies of colonization and imperialism mm -hmm. and slavery that often remains somewhat subordinated mm -hmm. to the other plots that might be happening in, say, a Jane Austen novel, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And what you're doing, I think, in this project is really recentering that narrative. Um, you know, in some ways, taking something that some have seen as slight outside the frame of the novel yeah. and putting it squarely in your purview. And the question that I want to ask that, that comes out of that is actually a question about two formal strategies that for you are also really conceptual strategies, which are framing and cropping. So mm -hmm. if you could say a little bit, I mean, these images all really demonstrate um, how, how smart you are about the crop and the frame. I mean, the frame often here, we see these panes, window, you know, glass panes, but often mm -hmm. people are looking through, you, you, people are looking through an attis, um, frames within frames. This is another, yeah, it's a great instance of a frame, a, a kind of, um, so always your work very self-aware of itself mm -hmm. as related to a history of photography and also as a queer black man, legacies of how queer black bodies have been inframed in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a great image. But also I want to talk about your use of the crop and the crop is kind of related to the yeah. frame, of course, but slightly different. And so it'll work, like if we go back to the one right before, or the one that preceded this, where it's just a little body part, uh, even before that. Such a, I think the use here of mm -hmm. the crop is so suggestive. And in others of your work, I'm thinking of self-portrait holding Joshua's hand. Mm -hmm. Again, so thoughtful about exactly where the crop is going to suggest a narrative or yeah. in a way play with that dynamic that you've already talked about between kind of concealment and revelation, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, I, mm -hmm. I might, I almost I call it, it's almost coy. It can be a little bit coy, you know, like <laughs> withholding well, and uh, giving or, but, yeah. or maybe it's just- I mean, they're very well, honest. Like, <laughs> yeah. Could you just okay. say more about how the cropping and framing as they relate to your, um, your practice. Yeah, so for a lot of work, um, I like to set up alongside just, uh, I like to set up uh, parameters. And so, so, for example, works like going back to that 2006 image, uh, self-portrait holding Joshua's hand, there was sort of like a serialized structure that I had making these photographs in my room. And the camera was always, for the most part, at, you know, it was a, a similar distance from the subject and sort of like always in, for the most part, in portrait mode. So there's sort of like a necessary cropping. But what you don't actually see with that is I'm always really interested in sequence. So the camera might move. And, and this is also actually something that I was thinking about including in this, but I didn't which is sort of the first instance of realizing that um, the, uh, that, uh, it's so, well, yeah, the easiest way to say it, that the, that the photograph is not reliable, but what's actually, where you find more information is in editing and the selection yeah. and, the, and what you choose to show and how you, what you put it next to, is that I, alongside those, I have rolls of film where we're having, where we're in conversation. Um, with that subject who's off frame in that self portrait. And so I realized as I went through those, and this is the work I was talking about where I was trying to use photography to answer a question that I couldn't otherwise find, that I was given in the resulting documents an infinite number of possible resolutions depending on what I chose to look at or what I chose not mm -hmm. to look at. So that like, I can introduce the camera, but like, it's really just, it just really kind of like multiplies what you have to chase after that. Mm -hmm. So there's that kind of cropping where I all, where in the larger sense of the work, as he is just off frame and you can, that frame exists somewhere else. Mm -hmm. With these, um, there's a type of cropping that would happen based on the mirror. So if I, I guess I could go all the way back to the very beginning. <laughs> I hope this doesn't like give people a head spin or something. What, what we just see a glimpse of, okay. you know? So, there, it exerts strange power in a way. Yeah, so this is the mirror I was photographing in. It's a little mirror that's on the inside of a closet door. And so I was, for the most part, I, for those images, I'm, I'm restricted to kind of like the edges of it. Like I didn't want to reveal the edges in those. So, in 
so there's that kind of cropping that's happening. But also, if I jump back, um, what you're not seeing in this is a, is a progression of me photographing, trying to look, I sat myself in front of the mirror and I'm looking at myself and I'm trying to bend as far back to look into this attic space. And there's a progression of images of me zooming into there and then moving back down. But what, so each one, you know, could be, you know, so the crop is part of sequence, but then there's a type of crop that happens when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to thinking about all of them together. In well, a way. Like I, I, wanted to begin, I wanted to begin with my hand, with looking up into attic space, being, you know, sort of like imagine from the point perspective of this sort of unidentified or the unnamed Moorish subject and then ending back down again um, on my body. Well, I did want to ask. I hope that answers. It does. That was great. That was wonderful. I did want to ask you precisely about the question of sequencing with this mm -hmm. series and how you did, how you came up with the hang and especially the kind of surprise of the shift to the horizontal mm -hmm. in a, in a, um, I don't know if it is a sequence or if it is a series, but how, you know, I do think of it as kind of notes on a staff or something, or maybe mm -hmm. words in a sentence. And then when you shift to the horizontal, you know, something gets reoriented there. Yeah. So maybe if you could just walk us through that, because I think it's a really, um, it's a um, fascinating um, set of images. Hmm. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's like it's always funny because I'm I have like in my in like in my head like I can see all of the other instances the arrangements of this that we didn't select <laughs> with with the curation, you know. Um, I think there, you know, there was a kind of like interconnectedness between all of them, like none, um, and so I've very rarely worked with. Um, images in the landscape format, but um, I wanted to sort of like move from the one in front of it, right, which is portrait orientation. And at first you might not think of it as a self-portrait, right, because you're looking out across the ocean and it is, within it, my entire uh, shadow is within sort of that frame, but it sort of pushes outwards. So we have like a portrait and then to a landscape. And so in that, in the second one, you don't see the ocean that's beyond. All you see is the light coming through, but I wanted it still to be, you think you move from the, a, a portrait against the ocean to then a landscape where, the, where the, the sort of like the light coming through illuminates two portraits, if that makes sense. I feel like they make sense in this, in this progression, you know, mm -hmm. they tell, they do tell a kind of elusive story and they are this kind of parentheses of your own body that foregrounds the apparatus to me, you know, mm -hmm. it does, it does imply something like some kind of journey that has mm -hmm. happened, mm -hmm. like from start to finish. Believe it or not, even though we just started talking and I have a million other things to ask you, I've been told that we should soon switch okay. to the Q&A from the audience, question. but I will ask, can I ask one more? Yeah. Can I ask one more thing, please? <laughs> uh, I, I'm such a fan of your work. It's been really, um, it's been really generative for, for my own thoughts about kind of, um, about histories of photography and um, especially kind of alternative histories of queer alternative mm -hmm. productions of, um, studio portraiture, you know, arising mm -hmm. also from zines and from club flyers and I mean just all the references mm -hmm. that you traffic in I think are um, something I wanted to at least give a shout out to that. Okay, but a different question, which relates also to this project and also to mm -hmm. the wi wider context of this Orlando show, which is that I was part of like a walkthrough that Tilda Swinton did yesterday, a virtual tour of the show. And she said something um, really interesting, which was that she kind of felt in her own mind that if Virginia Woolf had like written for another thousand pages, but not if she had just kept writing Orlando, that maybe Orlando would not just have switched genders, but would ultimately have maybe turned into a spaniel or mm -hmm. turned into like a bunch of flowers. <laughs> that in fact, the gender transition was kind of only one of many kind of um, alternatives. You know, there's a, mm -hmm. that was only just one of many options. And I was thinking about um, when you started to talk about the multiplicity of fragments and how the body parts start 
to become quite fungible. Um, mm -hmm. If we could go back to one of those with a drape, and how actually the interchangeability of the body parts also another object there is of course the tripod or the mm -hmm. drape and how you're making in, in a way you're animating those objects mm -hmm. you know so just as much so i just wondered i wanted to hear your thoughts about kind of the animation of yeah exactly yeah. so here are these, these are legs right there are legs and then there's legs so if yeah. you could talk a little bit about your relationship to you know objects and the objects okay. that, the, that you um often incorporate in your work yeah okay that's a good like transmutation or whatever it would be yes. called. It's kind of like a good thing at its center. I mean, so one of the things that's really complicated for me about Virginia Woolf is I think she was ultimately a very conservative, like she's extremely conservative in terms of ideas of like the proper order of the British Empire, right? And like Vita Sackville West is someone where I always was like, like she, I mean, she lived much longer, right? And so there's so much more record of her extreme conservatism, but there's, but there's something about like in the aspect of sexuality and gender, they were so like revolu revolutionary in a certain sense because it was necessary. Like, you know, Orlando changes sex because Vita and her first lover, Violet Trefusis, abandoned their fiancés and traipsed around Europe in the disguise, like sometimes dressing as a man or a woman and pretending they were gypsies. I mean, they just like adopted like sort of like racialized fictions in order to kind of like free up themselves from like a standard English, like upper class life, right? And so there was, it was already sort of like a tabloid scandal, like decade, like a decade before Virginia Woolf writes this book about Vita's re relationship to crossing gender lines. So, you know, I feel as far as they were interested in their own sort of like sexuality, they were fine with it. Like Vita and her husband who was gay were super open about like both of their like extramarital relationships. Like, but when it came to like race and like state and like, like they're obsessed with the like, like Vita is so obsessed with this home that should have been hers. It's the largest home in England. It's like, it's Noel was like, the I don't know like the it was this it was this birthright of hers right that she was because of her sex she was cut off from so anyways there's a really interesting contradiction there right and then I think about how it folds into like Derek Jarman's at a like you know where Derek Jarman sort of like use of this time period like Elizabeth etc and then where Sally Potter and Tilda Swinton come in it's like I think it there was some transformation, but I doubt it would have gone any mm -hmm. further. But then back to photography, one of the things that I was really interested in with um, the, the materials that I'm using now, the mirrors and the drapery is one thing. So the mirror allows for the accumulation of a type of, of a trace, right? That is rendered invisible against white walls. So it requires, a re it requires itself to reflect black to become visible. And I was like, oh, I, I love that like that can get to the heart of photography itself as a technology to insert like blackness as like a subject position and as a material that cannot be discounted. So well, basically I, I, I want to sort of fundament in a way. You know what I mean? Like yeah. blackness as a fundament, you know? Yeah. Like, and so like hopefully like if people are tired of like, you know, we're at a moment where thankfully there's so much attention on artists of color, on black artists, on all of this stuff. But we know there's waves in which people where like this stuff comes and goes. And I want to, I want to like insert into a conversation that like, even if we're just going to talk about photography as a productive technology that requires thinking about the subject position of blackness. Mm -hmm. So rather than making photographs that describe conditions of black life, which is something that like I've, I've, I've gone towards thinking about a subject position rather than defining mm -hmm. um, another type of experience. But also, so with the drapery and the mirrors, I'm really interested in a space to kind of like merge into and out of. So with works, so with works like this, I'm really interested in, in sort of like leaning into the sort of like um, disregard that position of like Olympia's maid, right? But thinking, oh, the position that's often might be ignored that can that can like 
literally fall back into the, the material that allows for what can be seen or what cannot be seen, its own desire can drive the scene, right? But also then playing again with this sort of like the illegibility of the body that's on display, which is not a white body. So there's, so in these, I'm really interested in like, if maybe transmuting into the material and looking at like a continuity there, mm -hmm. but from a ideally a more powerful su subject position. So, yeah. Thank you so <laughs> much. That was really, it was, we're going to have to do this again. Yeah. In person, hopefully, at some point. So, um, I know that Greg is eager to take questions, and I'm sure there are many, many great questions. So, I'll hand it over to Greg to um, okay. moderate that part. And every time I look over here, because this is Paul is in my screen right <laughs> here. And so, I, I, it's like this myth that I'm looking at you, you know, which of course we're, yeah. But it's, I guess it's probably alienating because I'm looking, I'm not, I should be doing this. Yeah, when I, talk yeah, to you. I moved you to the middle so that I wasn't doing this. Oh, you're good. You're so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia and Paul, for a great talk and for a great yeah. conversation. We have uh, 13 questions and only, or 15 questions and only about 10 minutes. So um, we okay. try to organize them a little bit. And I'd like to follow up on the, the first question here. It comes uh, from, uh, follows up on the topic of, of colonizers. The question is, the body of work stems from your inspiration of literature that details black experience from a white gaze. I'm wondering if you incorporate images from visual culture that, like Orlando, white gays perpetuate colonizers' ideas of blackness, and if you could speak about that element of your process. If there's other works that, that describe blackness from a white perspective? If, um, if you incorporate images from visual culture that, like Orlando... Ah, there was... So I've, I've never... Hmm. So like the sort of more iconic images like that, I've shied away from. There was this moment years ago where I like stumbled across in a used bookstore, this whole volume of German photography publications called Black that are like the most, they're like, you know, this sort of Maplethorpe inspired, um, just kind of like hyper-sexualized, like fucked up European <laughs> kind of like, uh, like image of blackness and of black male bodies. And I used some of those in my project called Studio Work from 2010 and 11. But what I've tended to do since in, in terms of incorporating into, let's say, I didn't show any of these works that have like the um, sort of collage elements, which are usually photographs of my studio wall. I've been really interested in collecting images of um, photographs made by black subjects holding cameras making self-portraits. Um, or looking at, I'm more interested in the work of like, I talk a lot about like Rotimi Fanny Coyote, you know, as someone who's like, who's kind of like reclaiming that position. Um, yeah, and I think it was, you know, it was Richard Bruce Nugent's text that really kind of like helped me find um, and expand that. Thank you. Very interesting and a uh, great answer. Uh, so con continuing with studio process, there's a lot of curiosity around your studio process. And uh, Emmanuel Famiano asks, have you how have you established some intimate settings with your subjects in the past? Mm -hmm. I guess that would include the self-portrait as well. And uh, oh. along the same lines, do you consider your work narrative? And Paul, do you record in, or envision to release a behind the scenes recordings of your process, your creative process? Or do you think that would complicate your final product? And that question comes from Inji Kim. Okay. Um, so the work has always, I mean, I photograph people that I know and I photograph people um, who I've had conversations with, who I know, you know, so there's, there's always, there's always like a relationship outside of the images, a friendship of sorts. And that goes back to the very first, the first work that I was making where I was looking, like, even though I wouldn't have anticipated at the time how long m most of these friendships would be, would stretch, you know, um, that there, I always wanted there to be a mutual investment and interdependence on the making of the work, but also it's like, kind of like, what happened to it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that, so there's a foundation of intimacy and I 
also you know work really hard for in terms of trust because I want them to be socially like accountable socially and ethically to the people in the work right and I'm so that's one one aspect of it um, and yeah so, so a lot of the people that you'll see in current work they might appeared over the years in various other projects but as far as like behind the scenes that's something I would never <laughs> I mean, there's there's so much already sort of like disclosed um, that environmental images or sort of um, any kind of like description. Like I'm also very restrictive on what can be depicted when other people even come into my studio in terms of like studio visits or press or things like that. Like um, I don't want the work to be about the process, you know, about like solving a riddle of a process. I want people to look at the images and to slow down, look at the images and then walk back and think about all the processes that, that build within the medium to make the work. There's nothing tricky in every image, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, thank you. But speaking about what you decide to include and exclude, um, there were a lot of questions about framing and uh, one was particularly well worded by Ardaz Sina. And it says, I realized there's a sense of hyper-awareness about the framework image in terms of visibility and invisibility health and the mm -hmm. subject. How important is that for you while taking or planning an image you're constructing? Hmm. Um, so I guess this is a good image to show, or I mean, kind of any of them. I often start with um, thinking about the, um, I had this moment um, where for a few months, I, this was back in 2015, I wanted to make images. I wanted to make portraits again. For a few years, I had just been working with sort of like uh, an accumulating sort of like mass of like uh, personal archival images and outtakes and stuff. And I wanted to get back to shooting again. I wanted to be so, I wanted to be super, super direct, but I, but I, I came up with this strategy where I said, I want to aim my camera directly at the thing I want to look at, but the only thing that matters in terms of composing the image is what's happening on the borders, what's happening on the edge, what's at that moment of like, what could be falling out of it. Um, and so I've kind of, that you'll you sort of start to notice that in a lot of the works with draperies or hands and et cetera, is that I'm, I'm really looking at what's happening on the perimeter and then at its center, there's a thing, there's a thing happening. And that's just sort of like the easy gratifying thing. Like, as they say, like draperies is like the most satisfying thing to like paint or take a picture of. Like it's always gonna look, you know. So I'm I kind of wanted to move compositionally. And so maybe that also gets back to Julia's question about um about framing cropping. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um there was a, a group of questions about your Alexandria project, mm -hmm. which you rarely show as you said. Yeah. I appreciate that. I well, appreciate that. And the first question was from Ann Walsh about what size these things are, uh, these, uh, these images are. Are they scanned uh, and then blown up or, or are they the size of the actual book page? So they are the book pages themselves. So okay. there is, so when the books, when the novels were first published between 1957 and 1960, they were, they were banned for indecency within the, the British Empire market. And so in 1962, there was the first, the ban was lifted, there was a first like edition published. And I use, I've always used that particular set. Um, and so it's just your, your regular tr like paperback trade size, sort of like about five by eight or so. And so each one of these works is a page pulled from the novels. So the idea is this, the, the protagonist is never identified in the first book. You're, he, his name is never spoken. We don't know who he is. He's describing his what he takes to be his relationship to this woman as, and is writing the book in order to understand, to make a document that says, this is where I was and this is who she was. Each subsequent book is a correction to that one. And so um, what I was interested in doing with each one of these books is that 
each page would be sort of like this moment where I, I selected pages where each one would be a moment of like an aha revelation moment on the nature of relationships or the nature of love that one subject was having to another, but that across each book, they're canceling each other out. There is no place to sit, but each page is obstructed by the, this sort of one outtake that I have of, of a failed portrait of the subject that I had been trying to make. And I cut it into 16 pieces and each one is overlaid on top of the, uh, the page. So they're not reproductions. Each one is an actual, so there are 16 of them. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, there was a comment, thanks so much for the illuminating talk, Paul, I certainly agree with that. And uh, again, about Alexandria, the work seems to evoke techniques of erasure employed in poetry. And I was wondering if and how the work is in conversation with that. Erasure in poetry. And I think mm. you alluded to oh that. Oh my gosh. Before, it's just a beautiful Amazing. Yeah. And then I mean, one more question for you, and then we wrap up. Okay. So yeah, poetry. I'm. I like wish I was better at like reading poetry. You know. Um, it's the thing that I always uh, try to pick up, and then um, I wish I just had the attention span to dive into. So that's. I, I'm glad that you bring that up, but it's not something that I had thought of so much. What I was thinking about is. Again, the idea that what is produced in an attempt to record a thing, to make sense of a thing, is often an obstruction or complicates the thing itself and just moves the target. So that, on the one hand, the support for each one of these is a book, is, is, it comes from this quartet of novels that I used in order to help me resolve the inability to make work and answer a question about a relationship. And then, again, what is, yeah, the, 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 the sort of like moment that each of the subjects has to grab onto is literally like erased, I guess, by my attempt at that in a medium that failed. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a great answer. Thank you. So um, Susan Miller had one more question and uh, I would re rephrase that maybe in the world of uh, uh, ubiquitous uh, in instant photography, why does portraiture matter now in the way that you do it? Oh, well, that's a really good question. <laughs> Why does it matter? I mean, the things, I mean, you know, portraiture is, it, it preceded me, it's going to continue after me and anyone else, you know, all I can really think about is sort of the, the like, the material and the technology at hand and what, and what my sort of jumping into it produces. Um, but I'm, but I guess what I would say is in conversation, thinking about the like ubiquitousness of like digital, like all of this stuff is that I'm really insistent on not in, in working outside of a realm of digital manipulation. There's like, I don't, I don't do any digital like editing or transformation or collaging or compositing that it's very important for me that everything is happening, um, physically that it has to be contended with it has to be dealt with um and oh no uh, did i get signed out no you're good you're good you're so oh good. okay something so <laughs> no. but yeah so that um it was really yeah it's really important that um all of the material that i'm using whether it's collage or, or the things that appear like collage etc but it's it's material that i'm actually working with that when that when you're looking at an image, you, that, that there's a real dealing with the elements of sort of touch and, and sort of like control and the handing off of, of control um, as well. Yeah. So, but yeah, portraiture, that's like a huge, that's huge. <laughs> well, we'll have to do another session like this. It was really a pleasure to um, hear, listen to you, think with you and explore your work with you. It was a very generous, wonderful talk. And uh, you have a, at least 20 more questions, which I'm all collecting oh here, my gosh. and uh, which I will email to you so that um, you can answer them <laughs> from, from the comfort of your home uh, if you want, and uh, we'll forward them to the people who ask them. And uh, with that, I think we're going to close. So I, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to allow you all to talk and to shout out to uh, uh, and 
and thank our speaker. So as you can see, your uh, voice has come up and uh, uh, you can uh, applaud or say hello real quick. And uh, uh, that's how we're gonna end here. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, again, thank the show is <laughs> Uh, so make some noise. Oh, thank thanks you all. Thanks for all. Hey. Uh, uh, thank you, Julia. Greg. Thank you. Yeah, we will do it again. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And then one day I'll be up in Berkeley so again or something. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> you all were a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. And uh, it was a really fabulous talk. So uh, great times. And uh, Thanks to the McAvoy Foundation and uh, to uh, Julia Brian Wilson for uh, uh, spending time with us and for um, making this such a compelling event. We have, uh, uh, if you enjoyed it, there's a way to support the uh, the effort here, and uh, there's a link that I'm going to post at gate.berkeley.edu. There's a special link if you want to try that out, and uh, that's right here. And our next uh, event here on. Uh, uh, the channel ideas.berkeley.edu is going to be radio by the theater and dance performance department. It's called Snowflakes or Rare White People. But I'd like to just end with a note that uh, the MFA is going to open up its exhibit Orlando so you can see the photographs in person the moment the shelter in place uh, um, uh, order ends. And uh, I don't know, are you coming up, Paul, for that? Um, opens up again? When is that? I don't know, whenever shelter in place ends. Uh, <laughs> What are you going to do first when shelter in place ends, Paul? Oh, <laughs> probably not travel. <laughs> <laughs> good idea, good idea. Um, but we'll come but no, I was planning, to, I was planning to get up there. Because I, I, my brother's in San Francisco and I have family in the East Bay and I was planning on getting up there at, yeah, in April, in March, but that didn't happen. Well, we'll, we'll find a time soon to do it again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good night. Okay, and, uh, thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Okay, bye. bye.